Hello, this is Terry Norrington from Congregation Ministries. And this week we've been looking at Romans chapter 2. So as usual, we will start off with um, some of the verses and then we will do some commentary on those verses. So we start off with verses 1 to 4. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you <clears throat> you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgments against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realising that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? So if we have a look in Matthew 7, we will see Jesus saying, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This seems rather an exaggerated point that Jesus was making, but the point nonetheless is that we shouldn't be finding fault with others when we have many faults of our own. We have to focus on our own sin and get ourselves right with God before making judgment on someone else. And the Apostle Paul is saying a very similar thing. God will not look favourably on us if we condemn, some, condemn someone for their sin, and yet we are sinful ourselves. And as human beings, we are sinful in nature. The only blameless person that ever existed was Jesus Christ, so we have no right to condemn others. We can obviously hate the sin, but we must view the sinner with love. After all, God loves that God loves them, so we must love them too. And if we are sinners, wouldn't we prefer that people treated us with love rather than being judgmental towards us? Paul reminds us of God's kindness, forbearance and patience. And if we pass judgment on people for the sins they, sins they commit, particularly if we are committing the same sin, then we are showing contempt towards the qualities of God. We must repent of our sin, and this comes through God's grace. If we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, then it is that spirit that will convict us of our sin. Let us accept God's grace and repent of our sin, not judging others of, their, judging others of theirs. We now look at 5 to 11. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who, are be, who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honour and immortality, he will give the eternal life. But for those who are seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honour and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, and then for the Gentile. For God does not show favouritism. So what was life like before we found Jesus Christ? Were we living lives for ourselves, not considering the needs of others? Paul reminds the Christians in Rome that a stubborn and unrepentant heart will incur God's wrath. His judgment won't fall favourably on them if they continue to live selfish lives, only out to make life comfortable for themselves without considering others as well. Paul has moved on from his words, uh, words against judging others and is warning against selfishness. Many people will claim to be Christians but still live selfishly 
with no thoughts or compassion for others. They believe that because they are in church on a Sunday or a Saturday or a Sunday, this makes them a Christian. What about the rest of the week? What kind of life are they living the other six days? On those days, many who fill the seats at church on the holy day will dedicate themselves to, to greed and sinful behaviour, believing they, can, they make up for it by going to church. Their conscience is eased by the attention at church, sorry, their attendance at church. But living a truly Christian life is so much more than that. If we truly believe in Jesus Christ and accept him as our Lord and Saviour, then our old lives will have died with him on the cross and have been resurrected in a new life along with Jesus, a life dedicated to him. And with him dwelling inside us, the Holy Spirit will convict us to do his work and shine his, shine his love. In James 2, we read, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Do we have deeds? Whilst we don't receive salvation through our works but works but by faith, it will be our sincere faith in Jesus Christ that will give us the desire to do good works or do, to do good deeds, shall I say, because the rewards will be great in heaven. In Matthew 25, we read, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of the brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. 12 to 16. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's eyes, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are law for themselves, even though they did not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, witness and their thoughts sometimes accusing them <clears throat> and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judge, judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. So in this particular passage, Paul is telling us to be aware of what is in our hearts. The Jews of that time would have had the law of Moses, and these laws should have been ingrained in their hearts. These should have been laws to live their lives by, but with 613 of them, it was impossible to keep them all. In, all. Instead of enhancing life, they became a burden, according to the Pharisees. Sorry, they became a burden. According to the Pharisees, God would judge them on how well they kept the laws, which in itself was hypocritical as the Pharisees were incapable of keeping some of the laws themselves. Indeed, many of the laws weren't God's laws, but man-made laws, switched from God's original ones to suit their purposes at that time. Jesus gave two great commandments, which, which can be read in Matthew 22. Jesus, sa Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. As Christians, these should be written on our hearts. If we follow these two commandments, everything else would fall into should fall into place. The Ten Commandments can easily be obeyed if we put into practice these two commandments. Have no other God and observing the Sabbath as falls in, into the first uh, of Jesus' commandments and all the others fall in, into loving thy neighbour as thyself. These are far easier to follow and obey than the old Mosaic laws, provided we have made the decision to follow Jesus Christ earnestly. And we must keep our hearts pure. It can be very easy to allow our thoughts to wander into sinful thoughts. And if we aren't careful, those thoughts can turn into action. Far better for our hearts and minds to be focused on God, 
and focused on loving our neighbour. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, we find in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. As Christians, our ultimate goal is to see God and spend eternity with him. God, God judges what is, what is in our hearts, so let's ensure that our hearts are free from, from sin and pure. 17 to 24. Now you, if you call yourselves a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are, uh, are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor for, of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in, the, have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then, who teach others, do not teach yourselves. You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob tem temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonour God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Matthew 23, verses 1 to 4, it reads, And Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but not do but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Our passage today, looking at Romans chapter two, verses seventeen to twenty-four, Paul seems to be giving the same message as Jesus is quoting above albeit his words were intended for the Jews in Rome. It is a particular reminder that those who lead in and teach the word of God must practice what they preach. Jesus was making the point that the Pharisees and teachers of the law were hypocritical, telling Jewish society how to get closer to God through the laws of Moses, and yet they failed to observe the laws themselves. Whilst as Christians, it is not the, these Jewish laws that we, we follow, but the righteousness and holiness of God. However, the same point still applies. We must not preach against sin, and yet behind closed doors we sin ourselves, or at least not intentionally. As people that proclaim the good news of Christ, we have to be sure that our hearts are clean and that our actions are pure too. One of the reasons many people refuse to turn to Christ is in the news headlines of Christian leaders who have fallen. Whether it be through fraud, sexual uh, immorality or some other misdemeanor, leaders who have built a huge following have fallen from grace. And both the Catholic and Ang Anglican Church have fallen foul of some of their priests who have committed child abuse in one form or another. The wrongdoings of a few rogue individuals have tarnished the name of the of their church, and, their, and the churches themselves haven't helped the situation by choosing to cover up the evil actions that have gone on, in some cases over a period of many years. And this gives Christianity a bad reputation too. Despite all the good that many Christians do throughout the world, the world itself will focus on and highlight wrongdoings of these few individuals and make out that this is how the church behaves in general. We know that this isn't true, but it makes it tougher to convince the world of the truth of Jesus Christ. It makes it harder to shine his love and glory to a world that is in so need of it. So this is why as Christians we must practice what we preach, to shine God's glory to a fallen world. We must guard our hearts God knows our hearts, and it is this that he will judge us on. Our rewards in heaven depend on it. 25 to 29. Circumcision has a value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had been not been circumcised. 
So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirement, law's requirements, will they not be, excuse me, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circumcisions, are lawbreakers. A person is not a Jew who is one who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit not by the, by, by the written code. Such a person's pride, praise is not from other people, but from God. So in Acts 15, we read how Paul and Barnabas presented themselves to the elders of the church in Jerusalem and argued the case against Gentiles having to be circumcised. In his letter to the Galatians, chapter 2, Paul writes how he came into dispute with Peter over the subject of circumcision. Now, in his letter to the Romans, we see how he's demonstrated that circumcision can be futile. At the age of eight days old, Jewish boys are circumcised as a sign that they are of God, and that they will, would follow the Mosaic law in order to get God's approval and be able to enter, the, the, enter heaven after death. But we know that God accepts those whose hearts are right, hearts that are righteous, righteous and believe in the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. Many of the Jews would be circumcised and yet didn't keep the laws, so circumcision was meaningless. In fact, with over 600 laws to obey, it was fair to conclude that none of the Jews could keep, the, keep them all, the Pharisees included. Paul was pointing this out to the Jews and Christians in Rome in his letter to them, as can be seen in Romans chapter 2. In fact, Paul points out that, in, that anyone, anyway who... Anyone who is not circumcised yet obeys the law is more acceptable to God. God is interested in the person's heart and his obedience, not rituals like circumcision. It is important to understand that today, God doesn't want us to follow rituals and laws. He wants us to have our hearts open to him and be obedient to his calling. Our worship in church has ended and our service in the world now begins. Go in peace and peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This is the sending out message of many churches after their weekly services. It is a reminder that it isn't about our time in church that pleases God, but how we conduct our lives outside of church that really matters. Many of a church's congregation will be filling, filling up the seats, but, as God's word, but is God's word engraved in their hearts? Are they even taking in the preaching that goes on in their church? For well, those who do go out, and church, uh, out of church to love and serve the Lord in, in the world, they are the circumcised people, having, as Paul puts it, the circumcised heart. The Spirit is living within them. Let us pray. Father, let us into the world to love and serve the Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.